comedian Schuler King. Comedian Schuler King was born Frank Williams III in Sumter, South Carolina. He knew at an early age that he was destined to be an entertainer, especially since he was the kid known for cracking jokes. King grew up in a traditional two-parent household in the Bible Belt of the South, where faith, hard work, and education were the foundations of what his parents imparted to him and to his two siblings. Comedy is his passion, but he has taken a rather unusual path to get to where he is thus far. He graduated from the University of South Carolina with a Bachelor's of Arts in Media Arts, where he joined the mighty, illustrious Zeta Zeta chapter of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. In 2013, he graduated from Gupton Jones Mortuary College with a degree in mortuary science. When he isn't on the road performing at comedy clubs and special events across the country, King works as a licensed funeral director and embalmer in Georgia and South Carolina. At his family's, family, at his family's funeral business in South Carolina, he wants to keep his family business and legacy alive. King, probably the only comedian funeral director on the comedy circuit, has opened for some of the most notable and talented comedians, comedians in the industry. His, he credits his parents' strict yet loving upbringing, his harsh surroundings growing up, and the state of the country today with giving his comedic style. King says comedy isn't about being happy all the time. Comedy is just as much about pain that people endure. When you hear 20,000 people in an arena laugh at a joke, it's because they can relate to the experiencing the same pain. His comedy began while he was a freshman in college. After he took the stage for the very first time at the NCO club on a military base, and the rest was history. King is one of the most energetic, rising comedians in the business. Although the comedy business can be very tough and filled with ups and downs, King credits his unwavering faith in God as the calming force in his life, which keeps him pushing forward. His hilarious videos that post him on social media have quickly become fan favorites, including a recent video post that is even played on a UK television show. The future is definitely bright for King. For most information about his comedy shows, you can visit his website at shulerking.com and follow him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and at Shuler King. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for this commencement, Shuler King. morning. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank and acknowledge God for allowing myself to be here along with these fine graduates and parents and everybody else that is here. I'd like to thank the faculty and staff of Gupton Jones for allowing me to be here. I appreciate the invitation. It, is, uh, it was an honor to come to Gupton Jones, but it's an even greater honor to know that I'm welcome to come back. Yeah, everybody doesn't get invited back. A lot of people can come somewhere. You can't come back. And before I get into it, I want to acknowledge my family. They're watching. Uh, my mother is here, but my family is watching on live stream. So I have to acknowledge my family and my wife, uh, Courtney. We're coming up on our one-year anniversary. Yeah, and I told her that I was going to give her a shout-out. So, And uh, since my mother's here, I'd like to um, just embarrass her just a little bit. Um, I'd like to give my mother credit for my comedy career, and my career in funeral business. Um, is, since parents are here, I want you to understand something. You know, parents have the ability 
and the authority from God to speak into your children. You can say things to your children, be it negative or positive, and it will come to, come to life. You know, it will manifest itself. Your words can manifest into your children's life. And I'm saying that because when I was a kid, my mother used to make us do Easter speeches at church. Some of y'all probably know what I'm talking about, you know. She never asked us if we wanted to do it. She just, you know, I think it was the second or third Sunday in spring, and next day, you know, here, here's your Easter speech. And I hate it. Like, I loathe the idea of doing the Easter speech. I couldn't stand it. I just didn't like it. And I guess one day I decided that I was going to be crazy enough to ask her why does she always, you know, every year you come to us with this Easter speech. Why, you know, you don't ask us if we, if we want to do it. You just tell us why, why, we, you know, why are you giving us these, these Easter speeches? And my mother told me it's very important for you to know how to get up and speak in front of people. And that answer was good, so it made me even more upset and irritated. So I got in the car, and I told my brother and my sister, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up, but it's not going to be getting up and speaking in front of people. So thanks, Mama. Now, on this day, I would like to tell all the graduates who are stepping into the professional realm of this funeral industry, congratulations. And the grueling task of school work is over. The year or 18 months that you sacrificed and the hard work is coming to an end on this side. Some of you may have left your jobs sacrificed your time with your loved ones, spent your hard-earned money to complete this journey. And I'm sure there were days where you asked yourself, is it going to be worth it in the end? And to make it even more special, you endured a pandemic through this process. But you persevered, and now you're here. And here comes the challenging part. As tough as school was, I have to be honest with you, like anything else, it's harder to be than become. And I know some of you have a little anxiety about the future. You're not sure about what's going to happen, how things are going to happen, when they're going to happen. We don't know. So let me ease your mind about your future. You are going to fail. You're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to embarrass yourself. Yes, you are going to fail. I want you to understand, look me in my eyes, my big eyes. I want you to look me in my eyes when I tell you that each and every last one of you are going to fail. But lucky for you, your journey is not determined by your failure. It's determined about what you do after you fail. That is what this is about. Everybody fails. Everybody falls flat. Everybody comes up short. You make a decision right now, in this moment, while you're sitting in this seat, listening to the sound of my voice, you make a decision. As you started this journey, what will you do after you fail? After you hit the wall, after the banks turn you down, I understand it. A lot of you want to be funeral directors, you want to be embalmers, you want to open your own business and all that other kind of stuff. So what do you do when you hit the wall, when your family isn't supporting you? In a nutshell, I'm saying success isn't measured by your accomplishments. Your success will be measured by what you overcome. If you're blessed enough to be in this funeral service industry, 
your late nights and early mornings are really just getting started. You'll be presented with a new challenge every day. And although it is rewarding, I don't want to paint a grim picture for you. This is very rewarding. This can be a nerve wracking, bite your tongue, what have I gotten myself into type of industry. It doesn't mean that you won't be successful. It just means your success depends on you. Now, I'm not a life expert at all. I'm just as flawed as everybody else here. You know, I make mistakes just like you do. But I've adopted a few principles in pursuing my gift, my gift of comedy and my gift at funeral service. I always say success depends on hard work, discipline, sacrifice, determination, love, fear, and faith. I always start with hard work because I was introduced to it as a little boy. If you're not willing to work hard, then you just won't be successful. Period. There is no substitute for hard work. There's, you, you're just not going to get it. If you're not willing to do what is necessary for you to get where you need to be, legally, may I add, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see none of y'all in the paper. But you have to do what is necessary for you to do. You don't want to get up 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes that's just going to be the route. I work 12 hours, go home, feet hurting, tired, sat down for three hours. Next thing you know, phone rings. We got a call. I got to get up. Go get the deceased, talk to the family, embalm the body. Next thing you know, sun starts to creeping up. What you gonna do? Go home, take a shower, come back and be refreshed. It's not like that each and every day. But I tell you one thing, if that is your, if that is your routine, you're blessed. Because there's a whole lot of people wish that they had something to do in this industry that you're in. They wish they were working hard. A lot of people are well rested against their own will. Yeah, come on now, don't act like it. everybody ain't burying everybody now. Come on now. You know, let's let's you know, it's, it's some people who who are doing it and some people who just got the building. That's just so you have to be willing to do it. If you want to be blessed, God's blessings come with great responsibility. And hard work is one of those. Discipline. You will need to keep from being distracted from pitfalls disguised as fun. Not saying that you can't enjoy life, but you don't need to party every five minutes. No. You have to have the strength to exercise discipline. Because if you don't, people in your life and in this industry will lose respect for you. You have to understand that discipline will make or break your life and your business. Sacrifice. Now, this is something that scares people the most. You know, your dream, your gift, your calling will cost you more than what money can buy. You're not willing to sacrifice blood, sweat, tears, time, patience, et cetera, et cetera. Are you really willing to sacrifice your old self in order to become a better version of yourself? Keep that in mind. I'm sure we all have the same conversations in every class. I want to open my own funeral home. I want to do this. I want to do that. Some of you want 10 funeral homes. That's fine. It's possible. You just can't take everybody with you. And you can't take all of your habits with you either. I'm not going to start naming habits. I'm just going to say you can't take them with you. 
some I, if I said habits, I know some of your own habits popped up in your own heads. We ain't got to, we don't have to elaborate on that. Now, another one, determination. This is usually the defining characteristic of those who achieve success and those who don't. In each of your individual journeys, you will face the same things in different variations. Haters, self-doubt, anger, confusion, and an all-around resistance to what it is that your goal is, to reaching your goal. You're going to just find some type of resistance to it. But if you can face that resistance, the obstacles that are both internal and external, but still be determined to move forward no matter what. And you possess an essential quality of success. So be determined. Goes back to what I said earlier. Make up in your mind right now, what are you going to do when you see failure, when you experience it, when you experience heartbreak? People don't believe in you. You have to be determined. And I'm going to get this. You don't see it. I don't, I don't see how I'm going to end up with $2.5 million to open up a funeral home. Just be determined. There's only one way to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. So love. Don't do anything that you don't love. Why go through hell to do something that you don't love? You can dedicate your life to something you absolutely hate to do. And you can be unsuccessful at that. Why do it to yourself? If I'm going to go through hell, it's going to be for something that I love. Anything else is a recipe for life of misery. So make sure that this is what you love to do. Please, like I said, you're going to have to love it in order to get up 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Those cases that are, that are just very difficult for you, you're going to have to love what you're doing in order to be able to stick in there. You're going to have to. I mean, personally, if you don't love it, it makes for a slack serviceman. Because this is the service industry. And you don't want to be slack. You know, I'm not going to be specific, but I had to say something to somebody just recently. They embalmed somebody, but they didn't complete the job the way they were supposed to. And they said, well, the family said they were going to cremate. I said, I don't care if they said they were going to eat him. Do your job. There's a standard here. And if you can't do this with love and passion and respect, a lot of stuff has been broken in the funeral home, but the door ain't one of them. And fear is another quality, another characteristic that you'll need. Many people give the wrong advice when it comes to fear. People like to say, don't be afraid of anything, just do it. But that's easier said than done. The problem is most people fear the wrong thing. Afraid of making a mistake, afraid to fail. When in actuality, you should be afraid of wasting your time. Be afraid of giving people the wrong energy. Be afraid of not pursuing your gift. Be afraid of not doing what it is that God, God has called you to do. But don't be afraid to try. Be afraid to quit. Most people don't understand fear is a most essential quality of courage. How could you be courageous without fear? When 
and someone achieves a great goal, it's not because they weren't afraid. It's because in the face of fear, they decided to move forward. So you can be afraid. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. Just don't let fear stop you. And lastly, but not least, I said faith. I don't know how anybody else feels about God. But I have unshakable, unquestionable faith in him and his ability. I don't know how to be successful without God. So ain't no point in me getting up here and giving you a speech trying to cut him out. You have to have faith in him. Some people don't believe in him. That's fine. You look at all this stuff. I don't know who built this podium. I know somebody did. I don't know who built those chairs, but I believe a person did. And if you can look at all of this stuff around here, these chairs, these lights, and you know somebody came up with the idea and put it here. But you go outside and you see the trees, the clouds, animals. You know somebody put it there. Believe what you want to believe, but God is real and you need to have faith in him. Because there will be times where it'll just be you and him. That's it. Believe in him. Believe that he will deliver. I can't tell you how many times he has shown himself to me. To the point where I stopped questioning. I stopped doubting. I ain't going to doubt no more because you done shown yourself too many times. I can tell you one story in particular. I was in college. And, uh, you know, in college, everybody's broke. Yeah, don't nobody have no money. And I remember saying a quick little prayer. God, all I need is $20. I can stretch this little 20 out to the end of the year, you know what I mean? It's exam time, so I can, you know, I can knock this thing out. Just need $20. And I had already started doing comedy. I was what they call an open micer. You know, that is uh, just when, you know, you're not getting paid. You just, whenever the open mic is, you know, clubs have a night called open mic, and you show up, maybe you go up, maybe you don't. So, but people knew that I was doing comedy in college. And a friend of mine named Jamie Downs called me and said, hey, man, we're doing an Apollo. We want you to do some comedy, man. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going to be able to do it because I got, you know, we got exams. I got to study. I got a project due. I got this and that and whatever. Man, I, I'm not going to be able to do it. And he called me about two or three times throughout the day. And I was on my way. I was getting ready to walk into my last class of the day. And he called me one more time and said, man, please, man, I just want you to, to, you know, do this for me, do this for me. I said, all right, fine. So now I'm cussing myself out in class, thinking I don't know why I just told him I'd do that. When I know I don't have time to squeeze in to do that, I got projects due, I got this, I got that. So I leave the building where the class was after class was over. I run all the way on the other side of the campus. I jump on stage, perform. Five minutes, I didn't even have a chance to prepare anything. I just got up there and just started talking, and I was funny. I was surprising myself. And then got off stage, grabbed my bag, and ran back across campus to finish the project. Once I finished, Jamie just so happened to call me when I'm leaving the building. He said, where are you? I said, man, I'm back. You know, I told you I had to work on these projects, man. I ain't, you know, couldn't stay. He said, well, you need to come back. You know you just won $100. Now, <laughs> now, $100 may not mean a whole lot to y'all. But at that particular time in my life, $100 was a lot. And it was God's way of telling me, I gave you something that's going to feed you. Use what I gave you. I've given you a gift. 
pursue that. I've given you a vision. I've given you a passion for this. And I'm giving you opportunity. I asked for $20. And he gave me $20 a minute. So how could I not? How could I not have faith in him? How could I not trust him? I got too many examples of how he's protected me, protected my family, watched over me, taken care of me. He's shown himself to me. Some of you all may know me from the internet and comedy. Some of you all may have probably been to a, a show that I've done, or, you know. Sometimes, every now and then, somebody asks me, what's the secret to success? I don't know, but I do know what I said to God that changed everything. And this is a true story. I was at the funeral home. I was in the back sweeping. Because, you know, my family don't care nothing about me being kind of famous. They don't care nothing about the shows. They don't care nothing about that. When I come to something South Carolina, I'm at the funeral home sweeping or doing something. So I was in the back. I was sweeping. And... Uh, I was just praying casually. And I remember saying to God, you know, it doesn't matter to me what you do with my career or what you do with me. If you want me to be the biggest comedian in the world, fine. If you want me to continue to be a virtually unknown comedian, that's fine with me too. But I do know that this is what you want me to do. And as long as I'm good with you, then I, I can accept whatever it is that you do with me. I just want to do your will. I just want to be in your good graces. The only thing I'm asking is that you don't move your hand from me. And I'm not saying that to impress you. That is actually what I said. About two weeks later, I did a video, and it did 22 million followers. And everything else has just been going ever since. And that was another message from God for him saying, I was waiting on you to say that. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is because when I was younger, pursuing comedy and all that stuff, you know, I would always see, you know, envision myself, you know what I mean, with money and, you know what I mean, being, you know, talk of the town. You want to see yourself in fine clothes, driving a nice car and all that other kind of stuff. And that's fine. That's human nature for us to want to have those things. But I spent at least 12 or 13 years pursuing that. But the moment I put God as the top priority, and pursued him, everything that I had been chasing after for the last 12, 13, 14 years, he threw it at my feet. And I, like I said, I'm not saying this to impress you. I'm not trying to preach. I'm just telling you what happened. So I don't know if you got another way or if you know your better way or if you think you know, but I would strongly advise that you have faith, that you believe and you build a relationship with God. And the reason for that is because this is not for you. Your education, your skills, your gifts, this is not for you. I had to learn that myself. It may feel like it's for you. Some of you have a whole lot of money and this and that and all that. That's, that's good. But that's not, that's not for you. You're here to be an instrument of God. You're here to serve people. At the worst time of their lives. Nobody cares about your money when they have to bury their mother. Nobody cares about the kind of car you're driving. 
or how many diamonds you got on your hand, how much your watch costs. Somebody mama did. And they came to you. They trust you. They trust your service. Not because you're so great, because God allowed you to be. Do what you need to do. Your only superpower that you have is obedience. Do what he's telling you to do. And you'll never be able to fathom completely all of the blessings and things that will be distributed through your obedience. You'll never be able to see all of it. You'll see some of it, of how your service will help people, how something that you said, something that you did, help somebody. Allow yourself to be an instrument. You can only do it through obedience. You'll have your time, but just like anything else, time is going to run out. I don't care how rich you are, how famous you are, how important you think you are, you're not that important. I'm not trying to say it to hurt your feelings. I'm saying that you're just not. Yeah, sun rises and it sets. You want to make your mark? Be an instrument of God. Period. A little screw doesn't know that he's holding together a house. He's just doing his job. So you just do yours. And hopefully, one day, you can be what I like to call a bridge builder. Like I said, this isn't for you. The things that you've learned, the understanding, all of these things that you picked up and the things that you will learn, they're not for you. They're for you to pass on. To continue God's blessing. You've been an instrument. Now you have to teach somebody else how to be one when the time comes. Are any of you familiar with the? There's a poem called bridge building my grandfather was one a little testimony before I tell you the poem when I tell you about determination my grandfather was one of the ones that stuck with the funeral home all of his brothers and sisters left because it wasn't making any money my great-grandfather was the one that bought the land and the house that they turned into a funeral home. You know, a long, long time ago, you know, that's what they did. They didn't buy no big building, make it all pretty. You know, a long time ago, you get you a house. Sometimes a house could fit on this stage, just a little house. Well, I mean, you know, you know, it's a little itty-bitty house. But... Nonetheless, that's how I got started. And he decided to stick with it. And at some point in time, I, don't, I can't recall because I wasn't there, but the funeral home burned down. Black man in 1950-whatever. My father was a little boy, so was his siblings, young children. They all couldn't stay there, of course. He, my father had to go stay at some neighbor's house. My aunt went to somebody else's house. My other uncle went to somebody's house. My grandmama went over there. And my grandfather stayed on the ground, or on the property, rather, with the burnt-up funeral home. And everybody was asking, said, uh, Mr. Williams, why, 
what you doing? And he said, I'm going to stay here and protect the little bit that I got. Every day, he called himself trying to build it back, trying to put it back, trying to restore what had been destroyed. Now, he was unsuccessful at that because he didn't know anything about carpentry. He didn't know what he was doing. He was just trying to get started. He was just determined to get back what had been lost. And a friend of his who was a carpenter, who was a contractor, pulled up and started laughing at him and said, Boy, I don't know why you're out here. You know you don't know what you're doing. He said, don't worry about it. Come tomorrow, I'll be back, and I'm going to give you some help. Man showed up the next day with two trucks full of men and material. And my grandfather said, I don't have, uh, I don't have anything to pay you. I ain't got nothing to pay you with. The man told him, I didn't ask for money. You just need some help. That goes back to the faith I was talking about, your relationship with God. One thing I do know about God is that he's going to do his job, but he ain't doing yours. You got to get started. Be determined. Do what needs to be done. Don't give up. I don't care how dark or how bad it gets. I'll finish my speech with a poem that I learned while I was pledging called Bridge Building. It reminded me a lot of a lot of people in my family. One day you all will be bridge builders or you'll have the opportunity to be bridge builders. Right now, you're crossing the bridge. Soon enough, you will be building one. And the poem goes as such. An old man was going a lone highway, came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast, deep and wide, through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim, the sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting your time and your strength building here. Your journey will end with the ending day and you will never again pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at the evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I've come, he said. There followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that, I've, that has been not to me, to a fair-haired youth, may a pitfall be. He too must cross the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. So remember what I said, hard work, discipline, sacrifice, determination, love, fear, and faith. And when you get an opportunity, build a bridge.